Excellent. Well, let's get cracking. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the first of two Wilberforce High Net Worth Trust and Divorce webinars. In this session, we're going to cover the joinder of third parties, and there is uh, going to be a second session on the 15th of July that's going to cover enforcement. Now, we're very keen today that the session should be interactive and would really welcome your contribution. So we encourage you to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, uh, rather than the chat button to ask questions throughout the session. And you can ask the questions anonymously or not as you wish to. So I'm going to start by introducing the session and then Joe's going to set the scene a little bit about why Bebahani might be an important case. I'm then going to use that to discuss when Bebahani suggests that you should not can join, when it suggests that you may be unable to join. Uh, Tiffany's then going to look at some particular points like where we are on joining trustees after uh, ACMA Dover and when you should resist joinder. Uh, Joe's then going to look at some alternatives to joinder and I'm going to draw the points together at the end. So the first question to start with is the, the so what question. Why does it matter whether you join or not? And the obvious answer is the judgment needs to be enforceable to have teeth. Uh, in any case with a degree of complexity, you're going to find lots of pools of wealth relevant to the divorce in the hands of third parties other than the parties uh, to the marriage and issues are going to arise about whether that property is in fact held for one of the parties to the marriage or both of them, whether those third parties have rights against parties to the marriage that are relevant, such as sums owing to them, or whether there are obligations from the third parties to sums of the money, so, so to the parties of the marriage, namely sums owing to the parties of the marriage. And therefore the question in each of those cases is when you need to involve the third party to get an effective divorce award. And that's obviously a critically important question to get right at the start of proceedings. So on one hand, if you're for the party seeking payment, you really want to avoid, if you can manage it, the proceedings getting out of control, having to join a lot of people with the costs and delay that can entail and facing another team of lawyers. On the other hand, if you get it wrong and don't join when you should join, then you can get all the way to the end of the proceedings and find that the resultant award isn't enforceable and that you wish you joined uh, at the start. So it's obviously an important practical question to get right and that's why the recent decision in, in Bebahani is, is so important. Good morning everyone, uh, well that's what I'm going to talk about first of all, um, but before I talk about Bebahani I think it's worth setting the scene by reference to a series of cases that uh, considered the question of joinder in advance of Bebahani. What's interesting about those cases is that they gave varying answers and I'm going to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour because I know Tiffany is going to touch on some of them in more detail later on. So the first case I've got on the slide is TL and ML which took a very formal approach. It was Mr Justice Mostyn uh, back when he was sitting as a deputy um, and he said that where a dispute arises about the ownership of property as between a spouse and a third party, it's essential to join that third party to the proceedings. And not only that, but that it's essential for the issue of ownership to be fully pleaded out as if it were a claim under the civil procedure rules. That approach was then endorsed by the Court of Appeal in Goldstone and Goldston, where a group of companies was joined. We then have two decisions both uh, also by Mr. Justice Mostyn, leaning the other way. The first of those was BA, BJ and MJ from 2011, where Mr. Justice Mostyn considered that the trustees uh, could participate as witnesses without submitting to the jurisdiction, and also invited the party's adult son to make representations without being joined as a party. And the second of those cases is DR and GR in 2013, where Mrs. Justice Mostyn considered that joinder was not an essential precondition for the validity of a variation of nuptial settlement order, service on the trustees in accordance with uh, the, what were then the new family proceedings rules um, was sufficient. We then have uh, finally on this slide, the decision of Mr. Justice Moore in TM and AH in 2016, 
which seemed to go the other way once again. Mrs Justice Moore held that in a variation of a nuptial settlement case, the trustees would almost invariably need to be joined in order to make the result binding on them. So we've got uh, five cases there on the slides, all seeming to point in slightly different directions. And Joe, is, is there a common thread running through at least some of them? Obviously, DR and GR on one hand and TM and AH do evince a different uh, attitude of different judges. But are there some common themes at least running through the, the rest or do they really turn on their own facts? Well, I think what, what those cases highlight is that the question of joinder is always a matter of discretion. And so in every case, you're going to have to convince the court that the order you're seeking is the right one. And so I think if, if, if anything is a common thread, that's the one. Um, DR and GR and TMA and AH obviously sound like they're, <laughs> they're diverging, maybe based on different judges' views. But it, it's possible, I think, to read DR and GR as simply saying um, you can have a, a, a valid variation of nuptial settlement order um, without joining the, the trustee of the relevant trust. Um, it, it just doesn't go on to consider the enforcement question, which is, um, I think, what, what we say the, the most important thing about joinder is. So that's where we were. Uh, and then towards the end of 2019 came Bebahani. And uh, there's a striking start to the judgment in the Court of Appeal, which I think is worth just reading the first paragraph in full. Lord Justice Mrs Baker said this, on the 18th of November 2008, at the conclusion of a financial remedy hearing and divorce proceedings before Mrs Justice Parker, Mr Bebahani was ordered to pay his former wife, Mrs Bebahani, a lump sum of £20 million in full and final settlement of her claims. Eleven years later, despite repeated efforts by Mrs Bebahani and her representatives to enforce the order, not a penny of that sum has been paid. So we've got a typical uh, catch-me-if-you-can husband and uh, there are some quite colourful facts underlying um, the divorce itself. The parties were married in 1985, they had two children, and for much of the marriage, the, the husband lived in Spain, while the wife and children lived in St John's Wood in London. In 2000, the wife discovered that the husband was having a relationship with her niece and promptly filed divorce proceedings, as he would. In the financial remedy proceedings which followed, the husband only sporadically participated and repeatedly failed to comply with orders for disclosure of his assets and income. When he did participate though, his case was that he had no significant wealth of his own and that he was dependent upon the generosity of others. The wife's case on the other hand was that he was a very substantial property developer in Spain, but he'd concealed his assets behind a series of companies. At the conclusion of the financial remedy proceedings, one of the judge's findings concerned a Spanish company which owned valuable land in Spain. The Spanish company's shares were almost entirely held by two Irish companies. And the husband's case was that in turn, those companies held the shares in the Spanish company as nominees for his associate, Mr. Al Sahoud. The judge found that in fact, they held the shares in the Spanish company as nominees for the husband. Fast forward nine years, uh, no money recovered, and the wife's been to various courts on various occasions trying to enforce her £20 million award. What prompted uh, the Court of Appeal decision was the appointment of a receiver on a, on a without notice basis over the shares in the Irish companies in 2017. The idea was that the receiver would be able to bring in the company's assets, realising the Spanish property, and distribute them to satisfy the wife's claims. Mr. Al Sahoud sought to set aside the order on the footing that it was based on findings in a judgment to which he had never been a party and by which he wasn't bound. The judge agreed and set aside her own order, and that's what prompted the wife to appeal to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal allowed the appeal and the receivership order was reinstated. What Lord Justice Baker said was that the fact Mr. Al Sahoud was not joined did not prevent the wife from seeking to enforce her judgment against the assets. Nevertheless, it was open to Mr. Al Sahu to contest the issue of ownership, and it was entirely appropriate for him to be joined as a party for that purpose. But what the wife was not prevented from doing was seeking to enforce her order against the disputed assets, simply because the issue of ownership could have been dealt with as a preliminary issue in the original financial remedy proceedings. And you, you can see on the slide the key dictum, which 
I'm, I'm not going to read it out, but basically says there shouldn't be a rule that uh, joinder should, should take place in every case. And that sounds uh, like a sea change. Ne next slide, please, Jonathan. Um, sounds like a sea change, sea change. Um, but I suggest that in practice, it isn't. Um, the first reason I say that is because this is a receivership context. It's not about a direct cause of action against a third party. It's about appointing someone to realise assets for whoever the beneficial owner ends up being. The courts might take a different view uh, where a party to a marriage was trying to enforce directly against a third party who had never been joined to the proceedings. The second reason I say it's not a sea change is because it's relatively limited in scope. It's not about whether an order that's made uh, where a party hasn't been joined is conclusive against that party. It's only about whether the order can be validly made. And where a third party wasn't joined to the original application, they can argue the merits again from scratch. I'd suggest though that it is a decision of wider importance. It shows that joined is still a case by case question. And that's clear from the final sentence of that key passage from Lord Justice Baker. Sometimes joined will be appropriate, and sometimes it won't. And the thrust of what Lord Justice Baker says is that there shouldn't be unthinking reliance on hard and fast rules, but instead a careful case by case consideration of whether joinder is necessary or desirable on the specific facts of the case. Thanks, Joe. So let's look what that might mean for a number of different situations. I'm going to look at therefore in light of that, when can and should you join? And when may you find yourself unable to join. And I've got three key points to, to make on it. It seems to me that as Joe was saying, that where you as one party to the marriage want to say that a third party holds property on trust for you or holds property on trust for the other party to the marriage so that you can get orders that that property be transferred to you, you're normally going to still want to join those people. That's point one. I think that's still very important. And the basic reason for that is you're not going to be able to uh, enforce the order uh, very easily if you don't uh, join. And there's a recent Court of Appeal decision called Ward and Savile that I've put on the slide that shows the perils, the dangers of what might happen if you don't join someone and then want to say, that property is held on uh, trust for you. So quite often, as was the case in Warden Savile, um, your property can find its way through a number of people's hands before ending up in the hands of someone quite a long way down the chain. So Warden Savile wasn't a divorce case. It was a case about uh, the victims of a, a tax avoidance scheme. So the um, relevant claimants had invested in a film scheme that they thought was a legitimate tax avoidance scheme, but in fact had been defrauded. And what they did is they brought a claim against a number of, of ringleaders and the property that they had transferred had gone through a number of people's hands. Now, some of the property they said had ended up in the hands of a wife of one of the ringleaders and found its way into a large London property that she owned. But at first they didn't join the wife they just joined the ringleaders and they brought an application midway through the proceedings to join the wife. The wife resisted and a consent order was entered into whereby she wasn't joined at that stage. The claimants then brought the claim to a successful conclusion against the ringleaders and got all the relevant findings against them. Then they turned their attention back to the wife and they said, I want to rely on all the findings that I got in the main judgment against you. And therefore, I want to be able to say that uh, I was defrauded and that the property went through various sets of hands and is traceable up to the point that it goes into the, the London property. So all that's been established in the first judgment and I just need to show the further step of showing that it flows into your property and so I can get an order against you. And what the wife says, no, you haven't joined me to the main proceedings. And as I wasn't a party, I didn't have a chance to have my say. And so the original judgment is of no effect against me at all. And the first instance judge, which was upheld on appeal, um, said that's right. 
that she wasn't joined to the first judgment. So the first judgment is of no effect against her. It's no halfway house. You can't take it into account a piece of evidence against her. It's all or nothing. And so technically the claimant had to start again against the wife. So what that shows you is you need to think quite carefully if property's gone through a number of hands that you join the right people and that you don't just assume that you join the, the main players. If you want to get property back from someone, then the very strong starting point is that you should be uh, joining them. So that's key point one. Key point two, though, is that Bebahani uh, throws into sharp relief that you can have a number of situations where orders and judgments may affect or be effective against third parties without the need to join them. And I've sought to um, group together some of those situations. I'll go through them briefly. Now, the, the first situation is where the third party can be said to be a privy of one or both of the uh, parts of the marriage, in particular, the party against whom you've got a judgment. And there's some useful discussion in one of the earlier Akhmadova judgments as to when the, the privy principle can apply. So you can have situations where you get an order against one party to the marriage, and then you're able to enforce against the third party because that third party is a privy with the other party to the marriage. But what I would say is that one needs to be very careful before relying on that um, at the stage of, of the, the main proceedings as a reason for not joining a third party, because the issue of whether someone is a privy is often hotly contested. And normally, unlike an Akhmadova, that question will be decided uh, by a foreign court, which might take um, a less generous approach as to when someone is a privy. So the normal fact set is that you get an order against the party to the marriage in England. You may then want to enforce abroad and argue that a party located overseas is a privy with one of the parties to the marriage. And that will normally be determined in the foreign court where you go and try and enforce your English judgment. So some cautions needed there. The second situation is that flagged up by Bebahani itself. Namely, you can have situations where you can get receivership orders or sometimes charging orders that affect third parties without having joined them to the receivership or charging order application. So quite often, if you get a receivership order, you might not know whether a third party is going to pop out of the woodwork at a later stage at the behest, perhaps, of the paying spouse and say, no, that they're the true owner of the property and the order should never be made. And the court rightly treats um, that situation uh, in a way uh, that is favourable to the person seeking the order, where they can't be expected to know that someone uh, may later pop up. So you can have a situation where you can get a receivership order, a third party then pops up, and the onus is then on the third party to show why the receivership order should be set aside. Bebahani tells you the mere fact that the third party pops up and says that they're the person who is the true owner of the property does in itself allow the receivership order to be set aside. They've got to turn up and make their own case as to why they're the true owner and convince the court that that is the case. Slightly more difficult is what the situation is if you as the person seeking, say, the receivership order know that there may be a third party who claims to be the, the true owner. In Bebahani itself, Lord Justice Longmore suggested that the initial receivership order was correctly made in the absence of the third party, even though it was known that the third party may claim the property. And obviously that was being viewed a number of, after a number of years of non-compliance with the original order. But I'd suggest that one needs to be a bit careful before assuming that you can bring receivership order applications or charging order applications and just not join people who may assert third party claims where you know of them. That needs to be considered um, very carefully as to who you need to join. The third situation is one that's quite common to us in, in practice. If you get a lump sum order against, let's say, a husband and they're the prime beneficiary of an offshore trust, I mean, in practice, that judgment often will cause the trustee to act in a way that it may not otherwise act in. 
and therefore have a practical effect against a third party. So if you place the husband in a position where he may be bankrupted, if the third party trustee doesn't come to his aid, well, the third party trustee will think long and hard about whether to uh, honour the award, given the potential deleterious consequences of forcing the husband into bankruptcy. And lastly, for completeness, the Warden Savile case deals with a fourth possibility. Sometimes, even in commercial cases, you can get what's known as judgments in REM, judgments that are good against the whole world, and they are judgments that are enforceable against third parties. But it's quite rare to be able to get an order that says, I'm making a declaration against the whole world that this is the property of, let's say, a party to the marriage. And the reason it's rare is precisely because you're making an order that would bind a third party without giving them the opportunity to be heard. So when then might you be unable to join a third party who has something to do with a divorce and the size of the matrimonial pot? Well, I've set out a number of possible situations on the handout. So this is the third key point that you can, when you start moving away from situations where a party to the marriage is saying, that's my property, you start getting into territory where a court will have to consider considerably more carefully whether it can and should join a third party. So let me run through a number of those situations. The first is often you can find situations where a party linked to one of the parties to the marriage has either relevant claims against third party or claims against it. So take, for example, a situation where the husband has a network of offshore trusts and those trusts uh, may have lots of claims against third parties or claims against them. And whether they're claims against those third parties or claims against the trust, that's highly relevant to the value of the assets in the trust and therefore the value of the resources potentially of the husband. So those claims are highly relevant to the size of the matrimonial pot. Nevertheless, whether those claims are valid ones can't easily be determined within the divorce because the divorce can't readily accommodate a claim by one non-party, let's say the trustee, against another non-party, say a third party uh, that the trustee's got some right against. So normally you're going to need to find another way to deal with whether those claims should be treated as valid ones for the purpose of the divorce. So to take an obvious example, in my situation, you may get a valuation expert to opine on the value of the assets held in the trust, which include the value of claims that the trust may have against outsiders or claims that outsiders may have against the trust. And the second part of that is that one will then need to give consideration as to whether some provision should be made in the order for what should happen if those assumptions turn out to be uh, incorrect, because that could rebound either to the serious detriment of the uh, husband if he has an award uh, which turns out to be overstated when it turns out there's a very large liability against assets he has access to, or, or the opposite. And so in the family law context, you often see, you obviously can see orders like reverse contingent lump sum awards, which can cater for that sort of situation. The second sort of situation, which isn't a mile away from that, is where a party to the marriage has a personal claim against the third party or may have a personal claim um, against it. And so a common situation at one season divorce case is obviously a situation where a third party might make a loan to a party to the marriage. And the question is whether that should be taken account of as a liability. And again, the court will look long and hard about whether it's necessary and possible to join that third party. Where it's a claim against part of the marriage, it will be possible to join the third party, but the court may well try to avoid doing so to keep the proceedings as proportionate as possible. So for example, in the soft loan cases, it may say I don't need to decide whether it's a valid loan or not, so I don't need to join the third party, I'll rather just consider whether the third party is really going to claim back the loan in practice and find that workaround. But that can give rise to some quite difficult issues at the, at the fringes, and a good example of that is the Privy Council case from the last year in Webb and Webb on appeal from the Cook Islands um, uh, Court of Appeal. In that case, the husband said that his entire wealth was wiped out by a tax debt that was owed to the New Zealand revenue. 
And a large part of the case, apart from the, the trust aspect of it, was whether that should be taken into account as a liability of his or not. The consequence of a Stark, if the answer was yes, he had no assets, whereas if the answer was no, you don't take it into account, then potentially um, his assets were uh, very high if you untreated all of the trust assets as being his assets. And the Privy Council found that you didn't treat it, didn't treat it as a liability. But that shows how much can be in play on these questions. That was the difference between him having no assets and a large amount of assets. And therefore, again, one needs to consider whether there's a way for the order to cater for the possibility that the assumption you make is the validity of the claim may be wrong. The third situation is where um, a party to the marriage may have some sort of proprietary claim against a third party, but it's more complex than just saying, that's mine, you hold it on trust for me. So situations may a, a party to the marriage may have a claim to undo a transaction and get the property back, what we in the chancery realm would call a rescission claim. And again, that's not very easily catered for uh, in a divorce claim. And so the court may well say, I just can't deal with that. I'm going to find, need to find another way to evaluate whether, that, evaluate whether that's an asset or not. So it may just make an assumption as to whether the claim is a good one or not and come up with some mechanism for dealing with what happens if that assumption um, turns out to be wrong. Now, the, the, the fourth, fifth and sixth situations are quite um, interesting. So you can have situations where the um, party for marriage wants to say that particular property in the hands of a third party belongs to it. So let's say you've got lots and lots of different assets in the, in the case, and a number of them are English properties, so you've got 10 English properties. And the claiming party says five of those English properties are held on trust for the, the husband, let's say. But there are lots and lots of other assets that the um, claiming party may want to claim against. The court will ask itself if you try and join the parties that hold the, the English properties, is it really necessary to do so? Is it necessary to make the proceedings this complex by joining all of them? Or is, or is there a way that I can determine the divorce case and give effective relief to the claimant without needing to do that? Now, I think normally the answer will be that if it's reasonable for the claimant to want those properties transferred to it, that the court's not going to shut them out, that it's going to say, fine, you can join that parties. But you can have situations where there are other assets that can be enforced against, where I think the court will look long and hard about whether it's necessary to join all of those parties, um, particularly if it will make the proceedings considerably more complex. And I think that's the message really of Bebahani, that because there are no hard and fast uh, rules, uh, that the court's going to look at how much joinder will add to the complexity, uh, cost and delay in the proceedings and balance that against whether it's really necessary to join these parties to give effective relief. And so I think all of those three bullet points will be uh, considered by the court. Um, is it disproportionate to join? Is it really necessary to join to get effective relief or determine the size of the pot? And are these claims that really got a sufficient link um, to England or not. Number of questions are, are, are flashing up. In the interest of time, I'm going to deal with them, but, but leave them to the uh, end. So I'll hand over to Tiffany to deal with a joinder of trustees. Yes, thanks, Jonathan. So uh, Joe and Jonathan have talked about the wider sort of property commercial aspects of joinder of third parties. I'm going to set the scene uh, for turning to look at joinder of trustees in particular in matrimonial cases, because there are some particular considerations that apply for those types of third party when we're thinking about joinder. So I think most people who are attending today will know uh, trusts can be treated in the family court as anti or post nuptial settlements that the court can vary under section 24 of the Matrimonial Causes Act 1973 or trust property can be treated as a resource that's available to a spouse under section 25. And of course, there will be uh, some circumstances in which one spouse will allege that trusts that have been established, which might hold significant wealth, are in fact invalid for some reason. Possibly uh, there will be an allegation that they're sham arrangements. 
Now, if a spouse applies for an order for a variation of a settlement, the family proceedings rules provide uh, that a copy of the application form has to be served on the trustee, the settlor, and anyone else that the court directs. And provision is then made for the person served to request disclosure of financial information and to file a statement in answer. But service of that application does not of itself make the trustees party to the proceedings. There has to be joinder of the trustees in order for them to be parties. So uh, next slide, please, Jonathan. As uh, Joe said, when we started the session, the cases on joinder of trustees have gone back and forth somewhat. It's not quite clear when uh, and in what circumstances trustees really must be joined to the proceedings and when it's sufficient just to serve them with the application. So we have uh, Mr. Justice Mostyn in the BJ and MJ case in 2012, expressing the view that there wasn't any need to join the trustees there. Uh, they ought to be able to participate in the proceedings by giving witness evidence instead. Um, and so and for trustees, there's always this spectre that the court will not have the full picture if the trustee doesn't provide all the relevant information and doesn't give evidence as to the nature of the trust and its assets. And so there's, there's always the, the fear that a lack of information before the court will present difficulties uh, in circumstances where the trustees have to act in the best interest of the beneficiaries. And it could reasonably be said, not to be in their best interest to fail to participate if that's going to result in the court taking a decision on inaccurate or incomplete information. So Mr Justice Mostyn's approach gives the trustees a way of doing that without having to be joined to the proceedings and without having to submit to the jurisdiction of the English court. Um, later there's DR and GR, Mr Justice Mostyn again, uh, and in line with his views uh, expressed in BJ and MJ, he said once you'd served your trustees, you could then determine matters without the need for them to be parties, even in a variation application. So he thought that joinder of trustees um, was not essential. It wasn't an essential precondition for the validity of a variation of settlement order. But as Joe alluded to, that doesn't tackle the fact that it might pose an enforcement problem, never mind uh, whether the order is valid. How are you going to be able to enforce it? Um, in DR and GR, uh, Mr Justice Mostyn, it did say that beneficiaries under 18 had to be joined unless the court could say uh, that the proposed orders were not going to affect their rights or interests adversely. Uh, but he did uh, make the point that trustees don't have to be parties because third party disclosure orders can be made against them um, as well as them acting as witnesses um, if they choose to do so. Now, by the time we get to TM and AH in 2016, Mr Justice Moore's view was quite different. Uh, he took the view that it was a tenet of Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights that requires a fair trial, that trustees should be joined before the court varies the trust of which they're trustees. And so he thought it was quite hard to see how the court could make the variation order without them being parties to the litigation, let alone how you could say such a variation was binding on them um, in those circumstances. So um, just trying to pull those threads together. In practice, it's not usual to see trustees joined where the application is for trust assets to be treated as a resource available to one spouse. The trustees can give their witness evidence, they can provide information without being joined. And it might be wise not to seek to join them. So they, they would feel more comfortable participating in the proceedings as witnesses without having to uh, submit to the jurisdiction. If there's an allegation of sham or uh, invalidity of the trust, then it's very likely that the trustees would be joined. And again, um, if there's an application to vary the trust as a nuptial settlement, despite Mr Justice Mostyn's views in that regard, I would have thought the trustees are very likely to be joined and they ought to be joined if you want to avoid an argument that the orders, orders are not binding on them at the stage of enforcement. So uh, let's look at uh, the applicable rules very briefly. Um, we've got the family proceedings rules, uh, rule 9.26b. This is comparable to the power under the CPR uh, part 19, uh, but note that the permission of the court isn't required to serve your trustees outside the jurisdiction under the family proceedings rules by contrast with the CPR. Now I've set out on the slide uh, what the, the test is for uh, joinder under the FPR. Is it desirable to add the new party so that the court can resolve all the matters in dispute? Or is there an issue involving the new party and an existing party which is connected to the matters in dispute in the proceedings? And is it desirable therefore to add the new party so the court can resolve all of that? Now we've got guidance in the DR and GR case uh, 
uh, from 2013, Mr Justice Mostyn, and he said the applicant for joinder must show under that first limb that I've set out on the slide, you should show that there's an existing matter in dispute which, which requires for its resolution the joinder of the new party. So under that first limb, um, it's got to be clearly shown that there's an existing dispute that cannot be effectually and validly resolved without joinder. So you can see creeping in there is an, is an element of requirement for joinder rather than pure just desirability, which is what the rules, strictly speaking, says. Uh, under the second limb, uh, you've got to show there's this matter in dispute between a party and a proposed new party, which is connected to the main matters in dispute. So under that second limb, you've got to show there's a separate dispute between the party and the proposed new party and that it's desirable to hear those matters together. So you'll be looking at, um, is there a commonality of evidence between the two matters? Might there be a saving of costs if they're going to be heard together? That sort of thing. Um, and in terms of evidence, one of the questions that's been asked in the Q&A is uh, what sort of evidence is required for uh, joinder applications? Well, I've dealt with that a little bit, but one of the other pieces of guidance that we get from DR and GR is if you are, Joint, seeking to join a party for better enforcement of an order in a foreign jurisdiction under either, either limb one or limb two, then Mr Justice Mostyn said, well, you really ought to be bringing evidence that joinder would actually make a difference um, in that regard. If You can't just come along and assert or state your belief that enforcement is going to be easier if joinder is granted. That's not going to be sufficient. Uh, you, you ought to have some sort of evidence um, that uh, you're going to be better off enforcing if this party is joined. So we're going to come back to look at questions of enforcement in a moment when we look at ACNA Dover. Now, first of all, uh, I wanted to uh, just say something about considerations for trustees in particular. Uh, so uh, in the case of many offshore jurisdictions, of course, there'll be a firewall. So there's legislation of the trustee's own home court, uh, which will seek to protect the trust and its assets from enforcement proceedings. So somewhat different considerations apply in that situation from the situation where you've got an English trustee of an English asset, uh, the matrimonial home might be uh, in England, it might be in an English trust. So where you've got that trustee getting caught up in the family proceedings, considerations are a bit different. If your foreign trustee is joined by the English court, remember that the order itself doesn't bind the trustee. The trustee is not obliged to take part in the proceedings. There's got to be this further step where the trustee submits to the jurisdiction of the English court before it's going to be bound by the order. Um, so trustees have to be careful that they don't inadvertently submit to the jurisdiction. It's generally wise not to do anything at all if you can avoid it. Sometimes it's not possible to avoid it. Um, take no action if, if you want to be able to say you haven't unwittingly submitted after being joined. But uh, even simply saying that you agree to be bound by the decision of the court could well con constitute submitting to the jurisdiction. So if you are going to go down that route uh, uh, as a trustee, then you really ought to join actively in the proceedings because you'll want to make submissions to the court, you want to preserve the trust's position uh, and make the points that need to be made on behalf of the beneficiaries. If there's an allegation of sham, then you've got to consider very carefully, if you're the trustee, whether it's actually in the interest of the beneficiaries to participate in, in the litigation um, and defend the allegation, because it may be in your interest as a trustee, if you're being accused of colluding with the putative set law to defend its position, um, it, you quite possibly want to defend your own position, in the, but that may not be in the interest of the beneficiaries, because if you do submit to the jurisdiction, Again, you're opening up this possibility of the judgment being more easily enforceable against the trust assets that are overseas. Now, there certainly are cases where offshore trustees have fought and they've successfully fended off sham uh, allegations, but um, those do appear to be quite exceptional cases. So what foreign trustees usually do is they go to their own home court, they seek directions from their local court as to whether they ought to submit to the jurisdiction of the English court. And there may be good reasons for doing that. Um, it all depends on the circumstances. If there are trust assets that are in the jurisdiction in England or Wales, um, there's therefore a risk that an English award could be enforced against the assets directly in any event. Um, so the trustees would probably want to be a party to the proceedings to, to bring their concerns to the court and to do their best to make sure they can take advantage of their uh, indemnities under the trust instrument. But again, 
if there are some assets that are outside of uh, the jurisdiction of the English court, then you might be exposing those assets to enforcement action um, if you do submit. So uh, generally wise to do as little as possible uh, and to even if you're only attending to give witness evidence, do seek the directions of the local court before doing so, because you don't want to be um, caught on the hop. So uh, coming back to this question of enforcement that I was uh, referring to earlier, so in the DR and GR case, remember I said, Mr Justice Mostyn said, if you're going to join a, a, a um, third party for better enforcement of an order in a foreign jurisdiction, then you would want to bring some evidence um, that there is better enforcement prospects um, uh, rather than just relying on assertions. But it's fair to say that the question of enforcement hasn't always obviously affected applications to join in quite that way. And we'll see that in a moment when we look at <clears throat> the ACMA Dover litigation. Just standing back and thinking about enforcement action for a moment, uh, this is going to be covered more fully in our next seminar, but I'm, I'm just going to set the scene a little bit for our own purposes. There's a principle that if in practice an order against a trustee or in relation to a trust is, is not going to be capable of enforcement, then it shouldn't be made in the first place. Uh, but that is a matter of discretion, it's not a, a matter of jurisdiction. And there's a case called Hamlin and Hamlin uh, from quite a while ago, 1986, that says it is a fundamental principle that the courts in England will not make orders that they cannot enforce. So if you've got property assets situated abroad, um, even if the parties are present within the jurisdiction, the court may not make an order if the effectiveness of that depends on recognition or enforcement by the courts uh, of the foreign jurisdiction. And um, in BJ and MJ, Mr. Justice Mostyn referred again to the court's power to vary a trust and said that can be exercised where the trust is offshore, but following that well-established principle, the court may be unlikely to make the variation order if the trust and its assets are overseas, unless it can be satisfied that the order would be implemented by the court exercising control over the trust overseas. Um, but if your order is likely to be enforceable against the party in personam, then the court um, is much more likely to make the order uh, and uh, the ability to in enforce may justify the joinder of the third party as a trustee. So um, if, you're, if the court can be satisfied the variation order is going to be effective against somebody in personam, then uh, the order is more likely to be made. So to answer that question, whether it, are considerations of enforcement relevant to the joinder application at that really early stage? The answer is yes and no. It does come into play at the time, certainly when the court's considering what eventual order to make once the party has been joined, when it comes to establishing liability or establishing enforcement action. Um, and it does have some weight at the prior stage of considering whether a party should be joined, but it's not decisive because the court wants to go through the process really of reaching its decision on liability or enforcement on the merits. It doesn't simply throw its hands in the air in the face of um, some asset protection strategy uh, and accept that it's all hopeless that there won't be enforcement of the order. Um, it would prefer to make whatever orders it can to give the applicant the best opportunity to try to enforce the judgment and joinder is likely to be one of those orders. So, um, but if you are seeking to join just for better enforcement, then you probably ought to be able to show that there's, there's going to be some real use to the applicant um, for having the party joined. Uh, what I think the courts are trying to avoid is um, litigants throwing in a number of um, extraneous third parties, just on the off chance that you might be able to enforce against them in the future. They're not really there for any substantive relief. That's to be avoided. All right, so let's look at Aquadova, um, because this was touched on in that litigation. It's matrimonial litigation. It went on for many years and culminated recently in enforcement proceedings being taken by the wife against the husband and various offshore entities. So originally back in 2013, the wife petitioned for relief. Uh, and while the proceedings were ongoing, the husband was putting in place various schemes attempting to put assets beyond her reach, even uh, right up to when the final hearing was taking place, um, further entities were being um, set up uh, abroad and various transfers were taking place. So uh, the wife got judgment in December 2016, awarding her 450 million worth of assets. And then she began enforcement proceedings in Switzerland and Liechtenstein. 
And um, again, there just continue to be various trusts established in Liechtenstein, new trusts are being established all the time. Uh, in 2019, she issued enforcement proceedings, making claims under section 43 of the Insolvency Act and section 37 of the MCA. So she was saying these transfers have taken place uh, for the purpose of putting assets beyond my reach. And she applied to join the trustees of the Liechtenstein Trusts to obtain freezing orders and ancillary orders for disclosure against them. Uh, and she was granted that uh, application ex parte. Uh, the judgment is not very detailed on joinder. It does refer to the test under the family proceedings rules, which I referred to earlier that we looked at on the slide. So it's desirable to add um, the new party um, because there was an issue as to whether or not these assets had been transferred at an undervalue. Uh, and the freezing orders were granted on the basis that there was, there was a clear case that the assets had been moved into the trusts as part of a wider strategy of evading enforcement. And uh, penal notices were issued naming the directors of the trustee companies to make it clear to them that they were personally at risk of committal proceedings if the orders were breached. Uh, now the trustees didn't appear, they weren't represented at return day for the applications uh, to join and for the freezing orders. Um, uh, and the court took into account that the, the putting of assets in Liechtenstein was in fact part of this elaborate scheme to evade and frustrate enforcement because it was much harder to get at assets in Liechtenstein than other jurisdictions. So the fact that it might be difficult to enforce against Liechtenstein trustees wasn't a matter that troubled the court too much at the joinder stage. Uh, the whole point of the proceedings was um, to seek to take enforcement action against uh, the trustee. She, the wife was pursuing her claim for enforcement and the directions that were given by the court to try and maximize the prospect um, of uh, that enforcement action succeeding. So, um, and the question might be asked, well, why did the trustee submit to the jurisdiction in that case? It's not entirely clear because freezing orders had been made against them, perhaps the directors um, thought that they ought to come to court and explain themselves, um, but it looks as though really the husband was exercising control over the trusts and attempting to put as many obstacles in the path of the wife as possible. So he may have directed the trustees to submit and to make the stay application. So what they did was they attempted to stall the proceedings by uh, making an application for a stay. So, uh, Shall we uh, move on to look at uh, the next slide, which is about uh, resisting joinder. So the Jersey case law, Jonathan, if you could just move the slide on. Thank you very much. Uh, Jersey case law says well, it's generally inappropriate to attempt to argue against joinder. So um, there's a case called T&T where Jersey trustees were, didn't succeed in resisting joinder. They were ordered to pay the cost of opposing the application. It was a bit of a disaster for them. Um, if the majority of trust assets are vulnerable to enforcement in any event, because they're in England, then it may well be better to be joined and to submit to the jurisdiction so you can ensure that all the relevant points are made to the court. If the assets are very largely offshore, then the advantage of participating proceedings is likely to be outweighed by the elevated risk of enforcement. So the question is always, are, are you likely to be on the receiving end of an enforcement order, even if you don't submit? Uh, if the application is for a trust to be taken into account as a financial resource, the court can actually make a property adjustment order on the basis of a finding of fact without having to join the party. So you could potentially resist joinder on the basis that, well, it's a financial resource case. You don't need me trustee to be here. Um, so uh, don't make the uh, joinder order. Uh, how does that differ? How does a position whether you should resist joinder differ if you're if you're not a trustee, Tiffany? If you're a trustee, you've got the firewall, yeah. and you've got often and and you've often got the ability to go to your local court and ask for guidance. Yeah. If you're a non-trustee, you don't have the benefit of either of those two things. Exactly right. So trustees are in a better or special position and, and certainly a better position because they can obtain this guidance from their own court. They, they can probably take comfort from being behind a firewall. If you've got a company or an individual that doesn't have those protections, they've got to form a view themselves as to um, taking into account enforcement regimes without the firewall protection. Ultimately, you've got to weigh the disadvantages of exposing yourself to enforcement action. Uh, from submitting to the jurisdiction. You've got to weigh that against the advantages of fighting your corner. So yeah, it can be a tricky 
weighing exercise, but trustees have uh, got uh, legislation, local legislation on their side more often than not. So uh, it's over to Joe now to talk about uh, what alternatives there might be to join down. We've touched on some of these points, but Joe's going to um, add some more. Excellent, Joe. If I can ask you to keep your section brief, you had lots of excellent questions coming in, and I'm keen to have time at the end to deal with them all. Absolutely. I will canter through uh, the suggestions I have of alternatives to join down. Um, it's, this is all going to depend on the particular circumstances, so what's behind the threat of joinder, what relief is sought, where the third party is based, what are the underlying assets, where are they based, and what sort of party you're dealing with. So it's impossible to give a, an exhaustive list, but I wanted to just look very quickly at, uh, at this from two angles, first from the joining party's perspective and then from the, uh, the party on receiving end of the, um, of the joinder application. So. Depending on why you're seeking joinder, you might instead think, let's just seek disclosure. So you might seek a third party disclosure order or even Nor Norwich Pharmacal disclosure if you've got a third party who you can say has got themselves mixed up in wrongdoing. Um, you might also seek uh, information by way of letters, uh, kind of uh, what circumstances would you distribute from the trust, that sort of thing. Um, call as a witness. Sometimes you don't really want the uh, other side to be a party, the, the third party to be a party. You just want them to give evidence, put them in the witness box, and let them squirm. So um, don't let them derail the litigation by making them a party. Just bring them in as a witness. Um, of course, it's worth bearing in mind if they're outside the jurisdiction, you might not be able to witness summons them. So if they don't want to give evidence, um, you might not be able to force them to. My third point is leverage the threat of joinder. In other words, settle. Um, the threat of being drawn into someone else's divorce um, and dealing with lawyers for weeks on end, um, possibly months, um, is, uh, is not a particularly appetising one. And so um, that can sometimes bring people to the table um, and might even bring the other party to the marriage with whom they're allied with them. Um, reshaping the substantive relief, we've kind of, everyone's touched upon, if the court can order the relief sought without trespassing on third parties' rights, there'll be no need for joinder. That only works where the arithmetic works. One of the questions we were asked um, is whether um, this works in needs cases. And I suggest the answer is there actually. Um, often joinder will be more, more essential where it's a needs case than where it's a sharing case if the uh, reason for the re reason that the assets are not sufficient to meet the party's needs um, is because some of them are offshore. Um, my warning on all of this is beware the wait and see approach because. Uh, late joinder can be incredibly disruptive, not to mention costly. So consider joining at an early stage and you can always ask the court to tailor its directions to keep things proportionate. Um, looking at it from the other perspective, from the receiving party's perspective, um, uh, next slide please, Jonathan. Uh, asking very quickly what sort of role the third party should play. Uh, the first option is to write yourself out of the, uh, of the narratives. So that's, um, finding some way to uh, make yourself irrelevant. Um, that might be, uh, as Jonathan said, in relation to soft loans, uh, conceding that you won't uh, be looking to enforce the soft loan anytime soon. That obviously comes with downsides. Um, first, because it probably does down the party that you're allied to in the marriage. And secondly, because um, you might then find yourself, uh, find your concession coming back to bite you when there are subsequent civil proceedings, particularly if there's any threat, the, uh, the uh, debtor party might go bankrupt. Um, and then I've got various kind of roles which are less than being a party, so support behind the scenes to provide information um, and support to, to your allied party. Heckle from the wings is uh, the suggestion that you make submissions without being formally joined, like in BJ and MJ, the son uh, was asked to give um, submissions Playing a walk-on part is my way of saying uh, appear as a witness. Another question we've been asked is, um, can you really do that in circumstances where uh, you're worried about submission? And I, I think it's absolutely right to be worried about submission in that scenario, which takes me on to my, my final warning on, on this side of things, which is beware accidental stardom. It's all too tempting to assume that by resisting joinder and playing an alternative role, some lesser role, the third party can avoid being found to have submitted to the jurisdiction. But the evolving case law on submission means that's not a safe assumption to make, because if support shades into control, 
then there is a risk that the third party may be found to have submitted to the jurisdiction even without being joined as a party. Um, an example of that is Lord Hoffman's judgment in the Privy Council case of Cambridge Gas and Navigator about 10 years ago, and a more recent High Court case, Swiss Life and Kraus. Parties who control litigations from behind the scenes can subsequently be found to have submitted to the jurisdiction through the parties um, through which they control the litigation. So third parties need to be careful, they can't always have their cake and eat it. Thanks Joe. So the basic message is that one needs to think about joinder as early as possible rather than leave it uh, later. Now often in practice that's easier said than done because if you're for the claiming party you're often finding out information as you go about what's happened to the other party's wealth. And the basic message is if that happens, it's key to evaluate whether to join as soon as the information comes in um, because of the effect it can have on the, on the shape of the proceedings. And if you don't do so, you run the danger that you leave it too late and someone who you really need to join, you can't join because the judge is reluctant to adjourn the trial or take another step that would disrupt the proceedings at a late stage. Now that said, one always needs critically to test whether there are other ways of dealing with the point because one doesn't join lightly because you find yourself facing uh, potentially other legal teams if the other parties then submit and, and take part. So it's not something to enter into lightly, but something one needs to evaluate carefully immediately uh, when the point arises. Lovely. So with that, let's get into um, some of the questions which have been asked, which are all excellent questions, if I may say so. So the first question I'll take is about web and web. How would the web and web situation where you've got a third party with a large claim against the paying spouse potentially play out um, if that liability comes home to roost? So it's asked if it did turn out the husband had a liability to the New Zealand government for tax, uh, he could end up having nothing to pay and the wife could end up in a better possession, position than him because she could get all the assets from the award and then he'd be entirely wiped out. So how would that play out? Um, well, um, it's, there, there are two points there, I think, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll open it to, to Tiffany and Joe as well. I think the two points are firstly, um, how one ensures fairness to the husband in that perspective, but secondly, also the need for the, the, the wife to be slightly careful as well. So um, the way to consider ensuring fairness to the husband is to consider whether there's um, some mechanism for dealing with a situation where it turns out that he does have um, a liability where the courts assumed he has none. So if the court's assumption is that the New Zealand tax debt wasn't going to be enforced, but it does turn out to be enforced, then some mechanism um, for the divorce award to be adjusted. So reverse contingent lump sum or, or something potentially like that. The second point though, which is a point for the wife, is that a bit of care is needed where the wife's gonna get paid out of sums uh, that could be subject to attack by, by third parties. Um, I was involved in a case years ago, Independent Trustee Services and Morris, where it turned out the wife had received the, the proceeds of, of fraud and um, the wife should consider whether there is a chance of any third party coming against her if um, she receives certain assets from the divorce award. Now, I mean, firstly, a divorce award constitutes consideration for the purpose of working out whether she's got a bona fide purchase of defence without, without notice. So she may well be, be safe in that situation, but one needs to consider that carefully, and in particular, whether it's better that she be paid from certain asset, assets rather than others. So if the husband's got a problem, be careful that it shouldn't be used to to taint her. Tiffany, Joe, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'd caution against relying on bona fide purchase in a, in a, in a case where uh, the tax issues have been kind of ventilated um, in, in independent trustee services. Morris, um, the wife didn't know about the fraud until she'd received the, um, yeah. the, the divorce award. So I'd, I, I would say as, as best you can, try not to be paid out of, of uh, assets which might be tainted. Agreed, sage advice. Anything, Tiffany? No, nothing to add. Thank you. Lovely. Um, then uh, next question. Um, Michael Gurry asked the, the very fair question. Is it uh, the case that the court's less likely to be willing to join a third party in a needs case uh, rather than a sharing case? 
And I think the answer is yes, all things being, uh, being equal. Um, but I think that uh, whether it's a need or sharing case, the court's going to look at the whole situation before it. And a key part of that is going to be, does the, let's say it's the wife making the claim, fairly think that she needs to join these people to get effective relief? So if you've got a situation where most of the assets are out of the jurisdiction, but there's some within the jurisdiction in the hands of third parties, the court's almost think inevitably going to say it's fair to, to join those people because those are the assets that you fairly want to target and you show you should be able to join them. So at the fringes, if there are tons and tons of assets you can enforce against, the court's going to be, I think, far more stringent in looking at whether it's really necessary to join those, those third parties. So in part, it depends, but all other things being equal, I think the answer is, is yes. Any thoughts, anyone? I think um, probably in a needs case as well, the, the court's going to be even more concerned than usual to uh, make sure costs are proportionate. Um, obviously, there's only one pot and it's already not, not sufficient. So um, that, that's going to feed into that exercise of discretion. And as you say, I think the court's going to be careful not to allow things to get out of control if there are assets in the jurisdiction or in the hands of the, the other the party, the parties uh, that can be enforced against. Excellent. I'm just going to go on to Claire Blakemore asked this. Very fair question. Um, so in in BJ and MJ, Mr. Justice Mostyn uh, made a statement that trustees could attend as witnesses without submitting. What, what's our view about whether attendance as witnesses would amount to um, submission? Um, and does the view change if the trustees have been joined? That's a point, Tiffany, that you were, you were touching on. Um, what, what's your view on that? Yeah, I think it, it is... Um, uh quite a fine distinction isn't it and if the trustees have been joined then you can see that there would be far greater scope for saying that if they're also attending as witnesses and um, they look like they're submitting to the jurisdiction I think as, as a matter of practicality as well I was involved in a case where my trustees uh, were not joined as parties but they came to give evidence as a witness uh, and I had not anticipated that I, as counsel, would be asked to make any submissions or to participate in any way in the examination or cross-examination of the witness, because as far as I was concerned, I had no standing to appear before the court. My clients were not parties. But what actually happened was that I was asked to make submissions to the court. I was also asked to put my own clients into the witness box and examine them in chief, because neither of the other parties wanted to call my trustee as a witness because they both wanted to cross-examine them. And so this was, uh, luckily for us, I mean, it, it didn't really matter in our case, my trustees were English trustees. But if you find yourself in that situation, that would be uh, dreadful because then that, that would surely have been considered to be submitting to the jurisdiction if I'm making submissions on behalf of a, a trustee that's not even a party to the proceedings. So yes, uh, Claire, absolutely. It is dangerous, um, but I think trustees do need to try not to take an unduly cautious approach when they're um, when they're dealing with this, and they they really ought to be giving the evidence if um, that is the right thing to do for the trusts and the beneficiaries, so that the court's got all of the evidence there. But it does definitely need careful managing, I would say. Yes, no, I I, I agree with that. I think f firstly the, the the trend in the case law on. Um, non-submission is is to take a practical approach and so if a party says makes clear that it's not submitting but is trying to do something that is that is useful the court's going to be sympathetic uh, to that party and finding whether it's submitted or not I'd be willing to find generally that it hasn't submitted um, but as Tiffany says uh, in in practice trustees are often I think rightly quite quite cautious about uh, turning up to give evidence, particularly if they've been joined. And I think the view that's often taken is there is a significant risk about submission if you do turn up as a party and start giving evidence, whatever you might preface that with by way of it's without prejudice to my rights and uh, not to submit. Um, and I think that the very practical, important point that Tiffany makes is that whatever the answer to whether you technically submit or not, trustees are uh, often pretty cautious about turning up to give evidence because it can be um, an opportunity for the other parties to ask a lot of uh, questions in what the trustee would perceive as a quite, quite a roving way. Um, the, the judge may understandably have a lot of questions for the, the trustee. And so a trustee may often prefer to try to disseminate information in a more controlled way, uh, being helpful to the court and 
uh, giving a picture of the affairs of the, the, the trust to put the court in the picture, but it will often prefer to do it in that way on its, on its own terms, uh, rather than turn up and be, and be cross-examined, um, for example. So, yeah. And Jonathan, uh, Jane Keir has made the point yeah. um, uh, that, can you try and make it a precondition of your client giving evidence that it's agreed between the parties and approved by the court in advance that such participation is not considered as any submission to the jurisdiction? And I think that must be um, a, a good way of attempting to deal with it um, by agreement with the parties. And just in every piece of correspondence that emanates from the trustees, making it absolutely clear that um, this is all without prejudice to the contention that the trustee is not um, by doing any of this submitting to the jurisdiction. Yeah. Yeah, um, but if one does, yeah, agree, I mean, if one does that, one needs to think, will that uh, bind the, let's say it's the, the wife who wants them to, to, to give evidence, uh, will that bind the wife in a foreign jurisdiction? if she were to then try to argue that they had submitted to the jurisdiction and try and enforce it. So you need to think about that and whether you get something, something binding. Yeah, but you can only do your best, can't you, in those sort of circumstances, but it's a good start, but you're absolutely right. You'd have to um, consider what are the likely foreign jurisdictions and what might the enforcement process be in those jurisdictions, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, this question sometimes crops up when you're dealing with, um, without prejudice negotiations and FDRs and things like where the trustee can appear or participate in that. But in my experience, pragmatic ways are fine for the trustee to be at the end of a phone line. Everyone agrees that wouldn't constitute submission. It's helpful to have the trustee there if that's gonna be the thing that helps to, to broker the deal. Obviously the trustee may have its own view of whether it wants to, to turn up. And then finally, if I may, uh, Michael Gray also asked um, a question which you touched on Tiffany about evidential hurdle of attaining order for joinder of third parties, because uh, one often asks oneself the question, um, okay, I need to justify joinder. Um, so I want to put some evidence in to explain why it's a good thing, particularly post Bebahani, where the court's indicating we're going to look quite carefully about whether it makes sense to join. But on the other hand, you don't want to go to the extent of having to get lots and lots of uh, foreign law evidence about the precise prospects of enforceability abroad if you join and have it risk turning into some, some mini trial. So what, what would you do in that situation, do you think, Tiffany? Yeah, well, that, I mean, that wasn't the, what happened in Acme Dover. So the court wasn't concerned there to receive uh, evidence of um, foreign um, enforcement proceedings. But it was certainly um, mentioned and known that Liechtenstein was uh, a, a notoriously difficult place where uh, enforcement action of the uh, English order um, could well be frustrated. So uh, there's, I suppose there's a balancing exercise, as you say, between not going, not making it overkill, but you do have to say something about it and something about how desirable it is to have the uh, third party joined in order to um, make enforcement a better option for you. Yeah, I think that's right, isn't it? I mean, you may then do that and then find the application goes in a minute or two and you wondered why you did it, but there's always the risk, I think, that a judge perfectly fairly want to go through it quite quite carefully particularly if it's going to be opposed and so it's far better to have a good cogent rationale for why you want to do it but be can, can be subjected just to scrutiny Joe any thoughts on that uh, nothing to add lovely well with that I'm going to uh, draw the the session to a close thank you very much for listening uh, everyone we very much value your feedback and a short questionnaire pop up in your browser after this and so I'd really appreciate your views and how you found the, the session and also any topics you'd like to hear from in the in the future. And the recording of the webinar will be available on our YouTube channel shortly in case you missed any of it. To find our channel, type Wilberforce Chambers into the YouTube search bar. And lastly, as I mentioned at the start, today is the first of two uh, webinars this year and the next one will take place on the 15th of July at 9.15am. It's going to be led by Andrew Mould QC with Elizabeth Houghton and Zhao Wei Li who are going to be discussing recent issues in relation to the enforcement. So please keep an eye out for the invitation. And thank you again for listening and watching. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.